work this last night, so we'll see if we can do it tonight. I don't know. I'm on or not. All right. Well, good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. So thankful you've come out again to worship with us. And what we have been doing, as was brought up in our prayer, is we've been looking at Jesus and how he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, what that does to our faith, what that does to how we perceive the world around us, and really how we perceive the law of God, and how we perceive his word, and that it is one story, right, from old to new, that all points us to Christ. I'm going to tell you about a time when I think I had the most power in my life. Right, because there's a lot of things in life you're powerless over, aren't you? Right, the things that happen to you, you're powerless over. The things that go on in government, I'm powerless over. Right, the things that go on in the world and overseas and with wars and nature, I'm just powerless over a whole lot in my life. But I want to tell you a time when I've never felt more powerful. I was in the first grade, and I was given the whole monitor badge. And let me tell you, as a first grader, as the hall monitor badge, there is nobody who has more power in that school than that hall monitor. I mean, people were walking to the bathroom. What are you doing out of class? Just going to the bathroom. Oh, no, you're not. And you've got two minutes if you do. All right, you just, you just kind of get this, you get this power because you have this authority, and you start creating laws, don't you? All right, you start coming up with things of, you know, uh, but that's just... The people that we are, we get a little bit of power over somebody else, and we tend to use that power to benefit ourselves no matter the cost of somebody else, because that power makes us feel really good. We're able to, you know, use that to our advantage rather than to the aid of those whom we have power over. You've never had that happen to you, right? Maybe been at work, somebody gets a new promotion, and all of a sudden, right, the man who was, you know, working alongside you, he's got now an office job, right, down by the boss, and all of a sudden, he forgets what it's like to be the low man on the totem pole, and he starts taking his advantage. Well, maybe it's somebody who gets into some kind of public office, and all of a sudden, a public off office rather than being an authority who benefits those who they are over, what, who do they look out for first? They look out for themselves. And so as we look to Jesus, and as we look to Jesus as the lawgiver, because there's been a lot of people who've given laws, right, who have been lawgivers, even in the Old Testament, though they all come from God, these people held positions of power. Think of Moses for a moment. Moses, though directed by God, he had a position of power, did he not? Aaron and Miriam, so much so that Aaron and Miriam got jealous of Moses' position, and they said, why do you constantly speak to Moses? Why, why can't we be the ones for once who gets the word of the Lord and can tell Israel what to do? And God basically tells them, First of all, who is it, who are you to think, <laughs> who are you to think that you deserve such position? And so what if I speak to Moses? And so Moses had a power and an authority. He wrote the law, did he not? We call it the law of whom? The law of Moses, because Moses is the one who's being guided by God, and he gives the law to Israel. And one of the things that you see Jesus, and one of the things we looked at in our first lesson, you were not there, I'm sorry, but Jesus as Israel, was the fact that Matthew, the book of Matthew, is trying to portray Jesus as the representative of corporate Israel. Chapter 1, we've got his birth leading us all the way back to Abraham, tying him in with the story of Abraham in exile and um, David. And then in chapter 2, we've got his, right, the flight down to Egypt because Herod is killing the, two, right, the, the parallels with Pharaoh. And then he comes back from Egypt, 
right? And when he comes back from Egypt, what is, where does he go? He goes out into and he's baptized, right, through the waters, just like Israel was. And then immediately after his baptism, where is he carried? He's carried into the wilderness, just as Israel does. And as Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness, guess where Jesus quotes his defenses from against Satan? From the book of Deuteronomy, which are moments in Israel's life where they failed at certain aspects in, in Israel, in the wilderness, Jesus succeeded. So where Israel failed, Jesus succeeded. And then we get into, right at the end of chapter 4, and um, Jesus is establishing his kingdom. He's getting his disciples. And then in chapter 5, in verse 1, if you have your Bibles there, it says, Seeing the crowd, he went up to the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. All right? And so Jesus is taking on the position of Moses as lawgiver. Now, what we need to recognize about the Sermon on the Mount, right? It's the greatest sermon that's ever been given, right? It's Jesus is, I mean, if you could look to what is the message of the kingdom? What is the message that God wants those who are in his kingdom? How does he want them to live? You will be able to find a majority of the heart of the people of God found in the Sermon on the Mount. And he starts off with this idea of blessings. Blessed is the man who, right? Blessed is the weak. Blessed are the humble. And this is an aspect of the law of Moses that when Moses is finishes, if you will keep all of the law and all of the words of this law, you will be what? You will be blessed. But if you do not, you will be cursed. And what's interesting is when Jesus, is fin when Jesus finishes this sermon, turn to Matthew chapter 7, and we'll, 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 we're going to get more into this. But watch when he finishes this sermon. We're going to start at the end. And how the people respond. Because it says, When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them one as one who had authority and not as their scribes. You see, what scribes would do and what the Pharisees would do is they would constantly reference either the law of Moses. They say, well, Moses said. Okay? Moses said. Or Isaiah said, and that was their source of authority. Or a lot of times they would quote their rabbis, Rabbi so and so. Well, if depending on what school of Pharisees they were from, they would quote their teacher, and their teacher quoted their teacher, and there was always this passing on of authority that you would not teach as if you had authority, but you would try to gain your authority from either Moses or somebody who is greater than you. And so what we're learning and what Jesus is doing in his teaching, and they recognize he's teaching as one who has authority, who could Jesus quote? Who could Jesus reference that has greater authority than himself? If he is God, if he is the son of God, he quotes no man. And what we're going to look at make into our next lesson, not only is he just going to reference some things from the Old Testament, when he's called things like the Lord of Sabbath, all things were created through him and by him, who do you think gave the words to Moses to write that? Was it not from God? Jesus being the lawgiver, is he the one giving it to Moses? And so what we're about to see in this sermon and I'm going to be careful because I don't want to step on any toes, but I hope, hopefully you've understood this as you read the Sermon on the Mount. The way I heard it growing up was Jesus is taking the Old Testament saying, this is what you read in the Old Testament, but I'm giving you New Testament principles. Right? This is what is found in the Old Testament you have read, but I tell you and I'm giving you new commandments. What he's actually doing, and we're going to see this in a moment, is he's not giving new commandments. He's saying, I am the proper interpreter of the law of Moses. You have read, here's the conclusions you have come to. And Jesus does this throughout his ministry, doesn't it? Have you not read? 
And he expects, he will quote from Isaiah, or he'll quote from the Psalms, or he'll quote from Moses. And he says, you should have been able to read this verse, and you should have been able to come to this conclusion. Have you not read? Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Because Jesus is actually going to give us that purpose of what he's doing. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. Probably a better translation is do not destroy, right? But do not think. So Jesus is telling us, I'm about to give a sermon. I'm about to give a lesson, and I want you to know what I'm not doing. I am not coming here to abolish. In this sermon, I am not abolishing the law and prophets. And yet, I can't tell you how many sermons I have heard growing up that exactly what Jesus is doing is putting away the law and prophets. He's not. He says, I'm not abolishing it. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And this gets back to that statement. He says, I'm going to take the law and the prophets, and I'm going to give them their fullest meaning. Okay, I'm about to explain to you what it, when you read the Law and the Prophets, this is what you should have come away with. Here's the teachings of the Law of Moses. Because a lot of us consider the Law of Moses, and I remember listening um, to Dennis Prager here lately, um, or recently, and it was, it was a pretty sad teaching. Because when it came to actually the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus talks about the idea of adultery, where does Jesus say adultery begins? It begins in the heart, right? And Dennis Prager used this to tell the people who are listening to him that the difference between the law of Moses, Jews and Christians, is Jews are only concerned with what you do. Christians are concerned about why you do it. Right? Jews are concerned. They don't care, right? If you hate your brother, you're just not allowed to, you know, mistreat your brother. You can hate a man, but you cannot slap a man. You can, and this is Dennis Prager's words, look after another woman with lust in your heart as long as you don't commit adultery with her. And he says that's the difference, and he's a Jew, by the way. That's the difference between Jews and Christians. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus is going to let us know that the law of Moses was never just an outward appearance religion. The way a lot of us have been taught, the way it's been taught many times, is the fact that we think God wants no heart in the Old Testament. It was just a series of laws. It's all outward. There is no inward man in the law of Moses. Jesus, what he's saying, I am not coming to abolish the law of the prophets. I'm coming to fulfill it. And watch what he keeps saying. He says, for truly, verse 18, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or a dot, those are Hebrew transcripts, by the way, will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, the scribes and the Pharisees were masterful at having the appearance of religion, but being dead on the inside, aren't they? Go read Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus calls them out. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You tithe, you mint, you cumin, right? And yet, you have forgotten the greater things in the law, like mercy, justice, compassion. I'm going to ask you, where does compassion come from? Where does mercy come from for you to show mercy on somebody? For you to have compassion on somebody? For you to show true justice? By the way, the idea of true justice, the Hebrew word is basically scales. That's why I've got the scales up here. It's measuring scales because what would tend to happen, 
especially in the first century, is you would come and you would bring an offering and they would weigh your offering. What happens if that scale is not level? So they'd be like, no, that's, you know, you would, you would measure basically a lot, of your, a lot of your coins were measurements and weights, right? And they would, you would put it in, the, oh, you thought this was one ounce of this, one ounce of that. Actually, it's, it's only half an ounce. You need to give a little more. And so they would unbalance the scales. And what, G, what the word justice is, and Zechariah says to do true justice, is who is justice actually supposed to be for? Those who cannot do justice for themselves. Because when you think about the way our justice system works, is it more rigged for the wealthy or the poor? Who is it rigged for? Think about speeding tickets for a moment. Speeding tickets. Who does that really punish? Rich or poor? Just think about it. A rich man who speeds, $200 fine, what's that to him? Nothing. But what is it to a man who doesn't even have $200 to pay his rent? <clears throat> this, by the way, this is not unique to America. If you're caught in court and you can hire the best lawyer, what's, what's going to happen most likely? You're probably going to walk away free, right? But if you can't afford that million-dollar lawyer and you've got a public offender, not saying they're all bad, likelihood, who's going to have the better case? And so this word and what Jesus is desiring is this idea of justice. And it's always, we need to extend justice and mercy and compassion so that those who have not actually have something. You lift up, and James 1 actually says this, right? The gospel is about humbling the rich and exalting the humble. Those who are poor feel rich. Those who rich are humbled. And so that we are all what? One and united and equal in Christ Jesus. And the Pharisees did not understand that. In the story of the widow with her two minds, does that justice more than anything? The Pharisees and scribes, what did they come in with their baskets of money? And they think because they've given much, that they are more righteous because the law tells them to give. And therefore, if I can give more money than you, what must that mean about myself? I'm more righteous. And yet the widow with two mites, she gave all that she had. Where does that come from? That comes from here, doesn't it? And so even in the law, it is about heart. Right? Because Jesus will say, I, you have read, right? You have read, you have heard to not to murder your brother. But I tell you to not hate your brother in your heart. Now, here's another aspect of this. Did Jesus bring a harder law or an easier law to follow? Now, he brought a less burdensome law in the sense of my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and we're going to see how that happens here in a little bit, but put that to the side. If I were to tell you, you must give to the poor, but I don't care what you feel about the poor, I just want you to give to the poor. Okay, I can do that. I don't like it, but I can do it. But what if I tell you, you must love the poor? when you give before. Which one's easier? Which one's harder? Is the checklist, is it easier? I want you to show up Sunday morning for worship and you have to be here. And your faithfulness is dependent upon your attendance. I can get a good attendance. I can show up here and fall asleep, can't I? I, I can show up and not, and not actually worship. I can sing songs. Right? And not have any heart. But hey, it looks good, doesn't it? I'm here at worship. I've dressed my best. I've sung my best. I gave my best. And Jesus would say things like, but your heart is far from me. And by the way, he's quoting the law. And by the way, when you go read Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to give you some homework today because I can't go through all of it. Give me a little bit of time, but not that much time. 
Go read Leviticus chapter 19. All he's doing is taking the holiness code from Leviticus chapter 19 and he's expounding it. And you know what word is used 27 times in Leviticus chapter 19 after he gives every single command? Oh, need to go to the next one. After he gives every single command, I be, why are you doing this? Because I am the Lord. Why do you love your neighbor? Because I am the Lord. Why do you not murder your brother? Because I am the Lord. Why do you give to the poor? Because I am the Lord. Why do you not commit adultery? Because I am the Lord. And what the book of Leviticus is trying to get us to understand is our relationship with God. Because we know who God is, that is why we behave a certain way. Because I am the Lord. Because I love your name. Because I defend the widow and the orphan. Because I do not want, I will not commit adultery with you, Israel, right? Everything is based upon the character and the nature of God. He is trying to get us Leviticus. The book of Leviticus is not just trying to get us to do a bunch of laws. It's trying to get us to look more like God. And when Jesus ends in Matthew chapter 5, what is Jesus' goal and mission in this sermon? Right? After he names, you know, do not commit murder, but I say not hate. Do not commit lust or adultery, but I say do not lust, right? Do not have no oaths, but I say don't make any oaths at all. Let your yes be yes. Not, don't defraud anybody, right? Watch what he says in verse 43, Matthew 5. He says, you have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. First of all, where is that found in the Old Testament? All right, if this is, you have read in the Old Testament, and I'm telling you New Testament stuff, where can you go in the Old Testament where it says, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy? What he's doing is, you have heard it explained to you by these Pharisees and these scribes of what it means to love your neighbor. It's, remember when the, um, remember when the, uh, the lawyer comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus tells him, have you done these things? Love God with all your heart, heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself? And what does the lawyer ask? To just seeking to justify himself, he says, who is my neighbor? Because there, there was a dispute. Who is my neighbor? Guess what the Jews would say? Jews are my neighbor. Fellow Jews are my neighbor. And what illustration, what parable does Jesus give to help explain to the lawyer who your neighbor is? There's a man on the side of the road. He's been beaten, he's been robbed, and he's been left for dead. Three Jews walk by. Right? Pharisee, Levite, priest. What do they do? It says they pass by on the other side. And then a Samaritan. Ooh. A Samaritan to a Jew was a dog. It was worse than a dog. Irreligious, unrighteous, unholy, so much so they wouldn't even want to walk through the town of Samaria. They'd walk around Samaria. Jesus, John Ford, decides to walk through Samaria, right? They walk around. And he says, not only did he help him, not only did he clean his wounds, he took him to an inn and he told the innkeeper what? Anything else that this man needs, you put on my account. And Jesus asked the lawyer, who proved to be a neighbor? And the lawyer had to submit. He had to submit the one who showed mercy. Jesus says, go and do likewise. Matthew 5, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you only greet your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. What is Jesus trying to get us to understand? You've read in the old law, and you walked away with something that was less than God. Does God do good things for us even though he hates us? For God so loved the world, he sent 
his only unique son, right? For God so loved the world. Romans 5, while we were enemies, while we were separated from God, he sent his own son. Can that come from a place of hate? Can that come from a place of resentment? It has to come from a place of love, doesn't it? And then I love, and I'm not going to go read all of chapter 6, but I love chapter 6 because um, Matthew chapter 6 is all about taking Jewish customs that made them feel really righteous and he tears them apart. When you pray, how are you to pray? Not like the Pharisees. And what do they do? They go on the street corners. They have these long, they actually have these boxes they would stand up on to, to elevate themselves above everybody. And they would begin to pray, hands in the air. They'd be wearing what you'd call these phylacteries that scripture written all over it, beyond their foreheads. They look like a walking law of Moses. They look like it. But they would pray to be seen by who? To be seen by men. God says, go pray in the closet. Go pray in your home so that you can be seen by God. When you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Right? Your father will reward you. When you fast, right? And fasting was a big religious practice. Look at me. I'm trusting God because that fasting was about trusting God. And yet they were using this religious practice to, to exalt themselves. Oh, it's been two days and I've missed three meals. They'd rub dirt on their face. They looked the part. What's wrong? I'm fasting because I'm righteous. Jesus says, clean up. Don't even let people know who is fasting for. It's for you and God. And all these practices, prayer, giving to others, and fasting were all about trust, wasn't it? That's why Jesus jumps right into at the end of chapter 6 that you cannot serve both the Lord and manna, right? And put your heart where your heart is, there where your treasure will be. Store up for yourselves gifts in heaven. Oh, don't you know that God takes care of the grass? That God clothes the sparrow and the birds? And are you not greater than one of these? So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things that you are concerned about, do you trust that God will provide? And that God will give to you. And then finally in chapter 7. Finally in chapter 7, he talks about judgment. We're not going to get into that. I want you to go to verse 12. I want you to verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. If Jesus has just been spending his entire sermon getting rid of the law and the prophets, he's confusing. He's contradicting himself. If this is something other than the law, this is the law and the prophets. What would Jesus say about the two greatest commands? All of the law and all the prophets hang from what? Love God with all your heart, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. For this hangs all of the law and the prophets. Here's the law and the prophets. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also for them. It's love. Do you want to feel loved and appreciated? Then love and appreciate people. When you're down, you want somebody to help you, then help others. Right? You constant. This comes from compassion, doesn't it? Being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Feeling empathy for them. We would use that word. But compassion was an all-encompassing word for empathy as well. Being able to feel what others feel. Paul would say, because we are one body, when one suffers, all suffers. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. Enter then by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy, it leads to destruction, and those who enter it by are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Then he goes on to say, Before, beware of the false prophets, all right, who come to you in sheep's clothing, you will know them by their fruit. Now, what fruit did Jesus just talk about? Can you tell real quick if somebody's giving because they want to be seen? Can you tell real quick when someone's praying if they're doing it to be seen by men 
rather than just from a humble heart. We've got to be careful with that, right? All right we've got to be careful how we judge. The way He said earlier, the way in which we judge others, we will be judged by. So we've got to be careful with that. But can't you tell real quick someone who's genuine and who isn't? Judge them by their fruits. Pharisees were easily spotted. Once you, once you knew what to look for, the Pharisees are easy to spot. The scribes are easy to spot. But it's not always so easy because remember the two men that were praying in the temple? A Pharisee and a publican, tax collector. What did one say? Lord, I'm thankful I'm not like these other guys. Like those who are greedy, those who are adulterous, those who do all these things. I give, Lord. I give a tenth and more. I, I practice all the things you've asked me to practice. And then you got this other man standing in a corner who won't even lift his eyes to heaven and says, Lord, forgive me, for I am a sinner. Have mercy on me, for I am a sinner. Where does mercy come from? Mercy comes from you understanding your need for mercy, doesn't it? And so Jesus, as lawgiver, as lawgiver, he's trying to give us laws that reach down to our heart. He's not just trying to give you a list of rules to accomplish. A list of rules to do, but and he doesn't care when you do them, how you do them. It's kind of like chores, right? Your parents have to give you chores, and um, I was always really good. My dad said, have the chores done by the time I got home. My dad got home about 6.30, so I started chores about 6.15, right? And you cannot dust, vacuum, and do dishes in 15 minutes, but it can look like it. Boom! Dust! Right? Run to the house, you're running to the vacuum, you're missing half the spot stuff, right? Dishes are being thrown into the dishwasher, right? And start it. Dad walks in, done. You know, eventually what would happen after all these things? I remember getting older, and unfortunately, it was like about a year before I started moving out. My dad never had to tell me to do any of those things. My mom worked, she got home late. My dad worked, got home late. Why did I have chores? I was there to help. It wasn't just a list of rules that my dad wanted to give me because he was mean and wanted to take all my fun away. He wanted me to be a productive member of our household. We all live here. What is Jesus trying to accomplish? He wants us to be productive members of not only just the household of God, but also society. Give to the poor. Be good. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And then, oh, I don't have enough time for that. Okay. Jesus will end the sermon. He will end the sermon with a person will come and say, Lord, Lord, have we not done all these things in your name? Have we not prophesied your name, cast out demons in your name? And what does Jesus say? Depart from me, I never knew you. What is he really getting at? He's getting at. I'm not look if, if 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 this is the conclusion of the sermon, the conclusion is this is a person who's coming and wanting rewarded for the things that he did because he thinks that his doing something is what God wants, and that is what will be his reward rather than from the heart humbly serving God. Because if you're actually coming to God on etern for eternal life one day, you're not gonna come, Lord, Lord, look at what I've done for you. You're going to say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Right? That's two different postures. And Jesus will go on to say, one is like I'm building a house upon a sand. It looks really nice until what happens? Do you think a person who's in religion for what they can get out of it, what's going to happen when things start to get rough and hard in their life? They're out. Because it no longer benefits me. It's no longer good for me. It no longer is what I thought religion would be. Because, you know, preachers promise all these things. Come to Jesus, right? Come to Jesus and you'll have this. You'll get this. You'll get that. And it's all the list of things we will get. Rather than have mercy on me, I am a sinner. And I've always, I've, I've made this statement before. If the only prayer God ever answers of mine is have mercy on me for I am a sinner, I will be good. I never get the house that I'm looking for, the next car, the job, right? Health, health and wealth, and right? 
if it, those things are good, right? And those blessings, it says, every good and perfect gift is a gift from the Father. And we need to recognize how God has blessed us. But if he stripped all of our physical blessings away, and you still had salvation, I'm asking, is it enough? That's the foundation that is built on the rock of Jesus. Because Jesus didn't say, I'm not just coming to give you laws, I'm coming to fulfill it. Because we couldn't keep this perfectly. Jesus did. That's why we need to be in him. And in Matthew chapter 8, he proves his authority. And the, first, the one that I really want to look at is the leper. He'll have a leper. He'll heal a centurion servant. Right? All these things prove his authority. He has master over the sea. He has master over demons. But I want, I want you to read Matthew chapter 8 when he cleans the leper. Because this to me is the epitome of what he just talked about in the sermon. Now, who is a leper to a Jew? A leper is an outcast, right? A leper is a person who's not even allowed in the city. He's got his own camp outside the gate, and he comes to Jesus. He's a representative of that group of those who are unworthy in society's mind. Behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. He's not demanding anything if you are willing. I know you can, but you don't have to. But if you are willing, Lord, please make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, said, I will, I am willing, be clean. And immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. See, Jesus, as lawgiver, his desire is that you be clean, not just from your leprosy, but from your sin. Now watch, and we're going to finish, right? I promise we're going to finish in Matthew 9. Matthew 9, this is a continuation, by the way. And getting in a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. These are after all these powerful healings. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic man lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Wait a minute. A paralytic came. What did the paralytic want? Probably. Right? For his, his legs to be healed. He wants to walk again. And Jesus' concern right now is because of your faith, your sins are forgiven. Take up your bed and walk, right? And the, the whole the scribes, who, right? Getting back to those Pharisees and scribes, knowing their hearts, Jesus says, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to rise and walk? But you know the Son of Man has authority to forgive earth on earth, for authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and walk. And he rose and went home. And when the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. Last little story, these next few verses. This is what's going to encapsulate it all together. Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man. Matthew, sitting at a tax booth. He said to him, this is a tax collector. Who is that to a Jew? Worst of worst, right? Follow me. Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And Jesus reclined at the table in the house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees again saw this, this is not what religion looks like. You're a rabbi and you're sitting with tax collectors. You're doing everything opposite of what we have built religion to be. You're sitting with sinners. You're healing people, right? You're around the wrong kind of people. Come hang out with us, Jesus. Why, do your why does your teacher, verse 11, eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when they heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of physician, but those who are sick, verse 13, here it is. Go learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Why does Jesus come? Why did Jesus come as the lawgiver? As he showed us what it means to live out the law. He's the proper interpreter of law. What is the greatest commandment? Go show mercy, not sacrifice. Not that sacrifice is not important. Right? He'll say that later. Now the sacrifice is not important, but mercy is the greater. Mercy leads one to sacrifice. Because when you have mercy on somebody, what are you going to give up? You're going to sacrifice things in your life, aren't you? I mean, everybody can use an extra 20 bucks. 
All right, everybody could use extra, you know, well, I've got this room in my house, and, and I know this guy needs it, but it's my craft room. Can't get my craft room to give this guy a place to sleep, right? My, my car, I mean, I really got to go somewhere. I know this guy needs a ride, but my car is for me, man. Sorry, right? And all these things that come up in our life, Jesus as the lawgiver is saying, they, this is for you to be a giver. <laughs> It's for you to be more like your Father in heaven. Take your enemy, pray for him, and do good for him. You want to talk about a humbling experience? I mean, all of us have the enemy in our mind, right? A person who just, oh, got that one person in our life that irks us, makes us so mad. Go love him. That's the law of the prophets. Go treat him the way you want to be treated. That's the law of the prophets. Will you be perfect at this? No, that's why we have Jesus, right? Jesus came to forgive us from our sins because we are sinners. This morning, if you're not a Christian, you're not a follower of Jesus, he invites you, follow him. You may be a tax collector in a booth, the worst of sinners, or as Paul would call the chief of all sinners, and he says, follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me, but be ready to count the cost of discipleship. Because he's wanting you to be changed. He's wanting you to be transformed into whose image? Not your image. Not a better you, but into Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And you, the way you do that is first you have to take care of that sin problem. Romans chapter 6 talks about it's we have to die, right? We have to die to self. We have to die to the old man. We have to become new and we have to die. We are buried with Christ in baptism, right? That water, is there's nothing special. There's no sprinkling. There's no holy water, right? It is a burial. And it is a representative that you are dying to self. And when you rise, it says you rise and walk in newness of life. You become a new creature. Someone who now can live by the Spirit. Romans 8, it's beautiful, right? You can live by the Spirit. You can follow God's commands because you're no longer concerned about your sin. You're now concerned about righteousness and doing the things of God. Or others from God. And if you have that desire this morning, the invitation is ready. Follow me. And maybe you are already have decided to follow Jesus, but you've kind of gotten back into that checklist mentality where you just kind of show up to church because you got to. Right? I've given the collection because I got to. See someone inside, maybe I should probably give this guy something. Right? Everything is because it's some kind of religious obligation you feel rather than I'm trying to be more like my father. Jesus shows us the way. He says, look what I'm doing. Go and do likewise. If there's anything that you need this morning, we ask that you come forward as we stand together and sing.